Welcome back to our lecture on metrics. In this part of the lecture, we will discuss GQM as a systematic approach to identifying metrics. The problem of identifying metrics is not just a research problem, it's actually much broader. Whenever people try to do some sort of improvement, they need to do that in a way that is tightly connected to reality, meaning we want to do it empirically and for that we need to draw data and need to be able to draw conclusions from the specific data that we gather. This requires to identify the right metrics and connect them back to our improvement goals. That's actually the background of GQM initially. Initially it was created as a method for software engineering improvement. However, it is, a, it is much broader than pure software engineering and the fundamental idea that it embodies, namely top-down refinement towards metrics, is applicable in a very, very wide range of situations. The driving uh, problem for creating the GQM method was that at this time people tried to collect a lot of different metrics and define metrics catalogs for them. These were standards that said you have to gather this data and that data, but ultimately they found that this data was very difficult to interpret and to collect uh, and to do actually good conclusions from these data. The background for that is metrics are highly context specific. So even though collecting certain metrics in one development environment in a specific way is not necessarily adequate for another. So it's not just about defining many different metrics, and these catalogs sometimes have like 100 metrics, it's really identifying just a specific matrix from which you can draw adequate uh, conclusions. That's also particularly important as matrix gathering is often a cumbersome and potentially costly um, potentially costly uh, activity. Therefore we need to make sure that we only collect this kind of data that's really helpful for us. The name of GQM comes from its abbreviation, from it being an abbreviation for goal question metric. So the idea is we identify high level goals. These are improvement goals, understanding goals in research and so on. We pose questions or we identify questions that we need to answer to solve this goal, to address this goal. And then we use these questions in turn to derive metrics that help us to answer these questions. So the key idea is really having a top-down approach from, of refining goals into metrics. This also gives the basis for later on using the data that we gather because bottom-up we get the interpretation of the data into the results basically answering our questions here, going bottom up, you know, the metrics and the data we collect for them, they answer the questions, and with that we can achieve our goals. Well, that's a fundamental idea. In order to set up a GQM approach, there are typically four different steps or phases that need to be done. The first is a planning, so it's not like Somebody sits down in the afternoon and just derives a GQM plan. It's actually a larger endeavor. Then we need to define the goals, the questions, the metrics. And this is input to the data collection. So this is a background. Of why are we interested in this specific data? And any data that is not identified through this metric derivation is not of interest. And this also gives us a basis then for the interpretation. We use the measurements to derive answers and finally attain our goal. 
these four phases we will illustrate later on also in a more detailed example. Right now I want to go more into what are these goals, the questions and the metrics. Let's start with the goal. As a basis for the creation of GQM goals, there is a so-called goal template. The idea is that we can always characterize goals in a specific way. So we analyze something, an object of study. This can be a process, a product or resource for a specific purpose. The reason uh, or the purpose of this is to characterize something, to understand something, to improve something. Yeah? And the differences in purpose may also lead to different questions and different data that we want to gather. Then there's a quality focus, what property of the object we want to primarily analyze. Here the examples, these are clearly software engineering examples, like reliability, flexibility, maintainability, effort, etc. Uh, but this can of course be extended to other areas and other disciplines as well. Then we have a certain viewpoint that we're interested in, like a developer, a tester, a manager, a customer. Again, these are software engineering specific. They can be extended to other situations. The important point is, even if I have the same object, the same purpose, the same quality focus, if I do it from a different angle, e.g. instead of from a developer perspective or a manager perspective, I will arrive at different questions. I will arrive at different metrics. And finally, the environment. What is the environment in which the experiment is run? can be company, can be department, can be project, can also be a classroom experiment, things like that. All of that influences our final metrics. All that together gives us this goal template. Analyze the object of study for the purpose of, the purpose that we selected down there, with respect to their quality focus from the point of view of a given viewpoint, in the context of a specific environment. And if any of those change, we will typically get to different results. And if you just think about that, the large number of potential combinations this template will provide you, you probably have an idea why context-independent metrics definition is harsh, hardly successful. An instrument when defining a measurement program is a so-called abstraction sheet. In this we start with the goal yeah, consisting of the five different fields that are identified up there and we derive so-called quality models as a first step. With the quality model we try to characterize what is a specific quality focus? What does that mean for us? Remember, let me go back. Quality focus could have been something like reliability, flexibility. These are nice words, but what do they mean in our current situation? What is reliability? Is reliability um, time until a specific uh, problem occurs in an environment? If so, in which environment, under which circumstances, and so on. So this would be the quality focus. The second step is identifying variation factors. Which factors have an impact on this quality focus? Because often it, we will not ex simply expect that our, our reliability is a fixed value, but variation factors could be well, it might be less reliable if more people are simultaneously using it because of stress on the system, things like that. Uh, so these would be variation factors which we try to identify. The idea of this abstraction sheet is 
it's guiding an interview, it's guiding uh, a cooperation with experts in the domain to derive the necessary information. Yeah? So we would not just say, okay, variations factors could be, but we would go out and ask experts about what are these variation factors or could be these variation factors from your point of view. Then there comes the baseline hypothesis. What do you believe or know is the current state with respect to the quality focus? This has two goals or two, two reasons why we want to ask such a question. The first is when pressed or pushed to answer such a question, often people will understand that there is more than they want, uh, can say in this abstract realm, but they um, will be pushed to provide more detail. So it will actually lead us to additional questions, it would lead us to additional metrics. Also, if the, we know a baseline hypothesis, we know the rough range of results we can expect on the one hand, and on the other hand, if there's a significant deviation from this baseline hypothesis, we know we have an interesting result later on in a measurement project. And finally, there's an impact on the baseline hypothesis. That's basically the interpretation of what the variation factors probably mean for the baseline hypothesis. You know, like under stress, we would expect a reliability that is half as high, something like that, you know? so depending on what the experts will say. Again, this will attempt to identify further questions and further resulting data, but it will also try to help uh, to establish when is a result that we will get of interest. So with that, let's have a brief exercise. What are the different elements of the goal template? Just try to recapitulate that, pause the video for a moment and try to bring this up again. Welcome back. Here are the results. We have anal analyzed the object of study for the purpose of the given purpose, quality focus, viewpoint, environment. So these five elements, object, purpose, quality focus, viewpoint, environment. These are the five different elements of the goal template and they are held together by this text, analyze object of study for the purpose of purpose with respect to their quality focus from the point of view of the viewpoint in the context of environment. Okay, so here we look at a specific case of an abstraction sheet that's actually taken from a specific project with Allianz Life. And the goal of this project was to characterize flexibility of software products in this organization, more specifically from the viewpoint of a project leader. So the first part, the first field in the abstraction sheet is the quality model. It tells us what do these people understand in terms of flexibility. And there are two qualities, basically. The first is the effort in person days. And the second is the modification effectiveness, meaning how much effort was taken in order to make a specific technical increase. Modification effectiveness is the higher, the le less effort is needed in order to make a specific increase. Yeah, so flexibility is basically this modification effectiveness. A software product is flexible if we have very little effort that we need to do in order to make a specific technical change. Now, the variation factors, they characterize what we expect to have an impact on these change rate. That's basically degree of reuse, the quality of the description of the requirements, for example, the better written the requirements are, the easier it's probably to say whether 
modification is necessary, how the modification should be performed and so on, the degree of communication and also the overall modification rate. Yeah, that's again, we're not discussing is this absolutely right, but it's in this context, this was the best description of variation factors people could come up with. The baseline hypothesis then basically gives us a distribution of the values that we expect. In this case, it's a distribution, not an absolute single value, because there are many different software products in this organization. So if we all of that put together, then we come up with a distribution. We get here some effort distribution, some modification effectiveness distribution, and also distributions for the individual variation factors. For example, we see there should be only very few software products with a low level of reuse, but there should be a large number of cases of software products with a low degree of communication. Again, this is the expectation. It's actually before the study is done. The goal is first to identify is there further information we need and second to identify uh, data on when we do the when we do have the results did it significantly differ from what we expected. In the fourth quadrant we see the impact on the baseline hypothesis. Here we have uh, the statement that, for example, a high degree of reuse leads to a lower level of effort. Well, so the minus one says both of them are negatively correlated. Yeah. Higher degree of reuse, lower level of effort. The plus one says positively correlated, higher degree of reuse, higher modification effectiveness. Similarly, there's a correlation between the quality of the requirements description and the effort, and that is negative, and positive correlations between degree of modification, uh, sorry, degree of communication and modification rate. Um, and there should be no, or there's not expected to be a significant uh, correlation between the modification effectiveness and the last three values. Mm. Again, this is all what is gathered from the developers, from the involved people in the beginning. It's not necessarily what the outcome of the result will be. Yeah. So we are just trying to identify information that we need to determine what are good metrics. With that, let's do a small exercise. What are the elements of the abstraction sheet that you just saw and what is their purpose? Just stop the video right now, take a few moments and try to answer that for yourself. Welcome back. So the overall goal is to assist in the identification of questions and ultimately metrics for these different uh, for the uh, goal definition. Yeah? And we have four parts to the abstraction sheet. And these are the quality model, which basically answers what do we actually mean with the quality, the variation factors, what will have an influence, and the baseline hypothesis, what do we expect right now? Well, does this also depend on something that we should measure? And one of the reasons here is if people try to precisely define what they really expect, they sometimes come up with additional questions with additional metrics for that. And similarly, for the impact on the baseline hypothesis, once they need to concretely define what are the potential influences, they will often also come up with different metrics and questions. 